Hello, this is class Bio 225, Genetics from Genes to Genomes, Chapter 6, Part 2. And this is Dr. Lucy Abgarian. So here we are going to talk about base sequence, how DNA is carrying the information and also the DNA, about DNA replication, how uh, the information is transmitted from generation to generation, uh, and about recombination, mutations, and also gene functions, we are going to talk uh, during future uh, classes. During non-replicating situation, DNA is usually is highly coiled. However, in order for enzymes or protein to be able to read the DNA sequence, it needs to be unwanted. And therefore, uh, during the transcription uh, and uh, replication process, uh, <clears throat> uncoiling of DNA is taking place. However, some genetic information can be accessible within double-stranded DNA. There are, for example, there are enzymes that are doing function, they are functioning, um, they are doing their function with backbone of DNA, not particularly with bases that are highly um, intact within the coil. Uh, for those uh, for those functions, there is no need to be completely um, unwanted DNA in order to to be able to do the replication process. Again, let's refresh our memory from the very first introductory introductory class we had where we talked about differences between RNAs and DNAs. And there are three major uh, chemical differences between those two. The first one, of course, RNA, DNA, R and D, is because of the sugar. Instead of ribose sugar, uh, DNA has deoxyribose. Second difference is the uracil in RNAs instead of thymine in DNA. And the third main difference is that most RNAs are usually being single-stranded uh, as opposed to DNA being double-stranded. And the most was a keyword in previous slide because it's only most RNAs that are being single-stranded, but they can form base pairs within other parts of the same molecule. In order for DNA to be replicated, first of all, unwinding of the double helix should take place, and that exposes bases on each strand. So each strand is becoming a template for synthesizing new DNA. So we are going to have uh, complementary bases uh, inserting on both sides for each for each of the strands so single do double helix becomes two identical daughter uh, double helixes initially <clears throat> there were three possible models for dna replication one was semi-conservative Another was conservative, and the third one was dispersive. So the conservative, the semi-conservative one is when um, there is original parental DNA, and then the next generation contains strand from parental DNA, and uh, one strand is the synthesized, newly synthesized one. So there are two daughter DNAs, as we talked in the previous slide, containing one parental strand and one synth newly synthesized uh, strand. Then the conserv and that's called watson Crick model. And the conservative um, model of replication is when uh, one of the daughter DNAs is remaining the same, the parental one, and one the, uh, the second one is being completely synthesized newly. 
uh, and then f so therefore uh, f during each generation there is one that is always that parental d DNA that goes along and uh, you just keep adding more daughter synthesized DNAs um, and then the third model <coughs> of replication is dispersive model which is uh, the model where the second generation daughter DNAs contain uh, both uh, fragments from original helix and also newly synthesized uh, uh, DNA so of course we want to understand which model is really the real one working in real life, right? So did also Messels and Stahl. They wanted to understand which model is the working proper model. So in 1958, they conducted an experiment in order to uh, determine that. So they separated pre-existing parental DNA um, f from newly synthesized daughter DNA and then they grew E. coli in media containing uh, nitrogen-15 uh, heavy isotope, then switched to media containing 14N, uh, which is uh, the normal isotope of nitrogen, and then <clears throat> they purified DNA from cells and subjected it to equilibrium density gradient ultracentrifugation. So with cesium chloride, it will form a stable gradient with highest density at bottom of the tube and then the DNA <coughs> forms a tight band at the position where its density equals the density of the cesium chloride. Pretty straightforward, simple, but I think ingenious experiment in, like, to understand this. So Kornberg and others worked out the biochemical aspects of replication in E. coli. <clears throat> so for the process of replication, high energy is needed. And uh, for that, uh, high energy uh, nucleotide triphosphate is being used for that energy uh, in order for DNA polymerase to catalyze new phosphodiester bonds. Uh, there are two step uh, process that, uh, that is uh, taking place. One is the initiation when proteins open up the double helix and prepare it for complementary base pairing. And the second uh, stage of the process is elongation where proteins connect the correct sequence of nucleotides on newly formed DNA stand. Let's look um, on a picture and try to understand how that uh, elongation process is taking place, how that backbone is being structured and uh, created. Now let's look at the schematics here. So we talked about nucleotide triphosphates, right? DNTPs, which are uh, double nuclear triphosphates. Um, so here that is that with three phosphates here. And the uh, DNA polymerase is for uh, catalyzing. Uh, the process is going to use the energy from uh, um, NT, uh, NTPs. And during that process, the two phosphates are going to leave, and one phosphate is going to remain here and is going to um, help to create the backbone on this direction using the O here from, it will use the C um, at the position three, from the first um, member of the backbone, and then it will be C O P O C, and then the uh, C will come for from the sugar, the at the position five from the next member of the uh, backbone. 
So this is how the backbone of the DNA strand is being organized by this covalent um, phosphodiesterase bond. So now let's go step by step through the mechanism of the replication. And of course, it should start from initiation, right? So there is an origin that is the beginning of the replication process. It initiates the begin beginning of it. So the initiator protein will come, recognize that site and bind to it. That will trigger cascade of different processes. So that will trigger for different proteins to come and start doing their own functions. First of all, helicase will come and will start unwinding the helix. Of course, it's not going to un, um, unwind the entire helix, otherwise it will create a huge mess. It does it with small portions, with small fragments. Uh, so each fragment that is being opened for certain amount of uh, base pairs, uh, it's called bubble, and then the both sides of the bubble that are still remaining intact are called the two replication forks. So then uh, the preparation of double helix uh, for complementary base pairing. Uh, is basically in process. And then the single-stranded binding proteins keep the DNA helix open. And then the prime, uh, the primase synthesizes the DNA, uh, the RNA primers. And the primers are complementary and anti-parallel to each template strand, which is because uh, the process goes from five to three always. So if one strand has five to three, another is going to, the, uh, the parallel strand, the complementary strand is going to have three to five, uh, which is going to be the anti-parallel anti to, the, to the original strand, to one of the strands. Then uh, the correct nucleotide sequence is copied from template strand to newly synthesized strand of the DNA. And then the DNA polymerase 3 catalyzes phosphodiester bond formation between adjacent nucleotides, uh, as we talked already in one of the previous uh, slides, how that process, how that formation is taking place. And that is the process of elongation. So during elongation process, we have leading strand and we have lagging strand. What are the differences? So when we have that bubble that opens with the forks on both sides, the formation of bubble is going to move along the DNA double helix towards one direction. The direction it moves uh, if it moves through, uh, towards uh, having the 5 to 3 um, is going to be the leading strand. Uh, however, the enzyme that is doing the function of reading the frame, reading the uh, template and uh, replicating it for the complementary strand is not going to do it through three to five. However, even though for uh, if you look from perspective of moving the bubble, it's going to be three to five. So it's still going to do it five to three. So what it will do, it will do five to three. Then the new bubble will uh, appear on the on its uh, opposite side, and it will jump to that new bubble and again read five to three. So that's why it's called a lagging strand. And there, uh, and those fragments have a special term uh, and they are called Okazaki fragments, short DNA fragments that are on the lagging strand. Those are the fragments that are within the bubble where the DNA is being read, even though the bubble moves on five to three side, but we have to read it from three to five uh, 
upside down so that's why we have to jump from one one fragment to a new bubble fragment and finally in elongation process uh, DNA polymerase 1 and DNA ligase are playing key role. So DNA polymerase 1 will come to replace the RNA primers with DNA sequences. And we already know what are the differences between RNA and DNA. And then the DNA ligase is coming to uh, join success, uh, the successive Okazaki fragments with one another, and that uh, that bond that join is uh, that joint is uh, covalent. So now let's see, let's look and see how different the replication process for the circular bacterial DNA. Um, will be from uh, from non-circular DNA. So for this, uh, again, uh, <clears throat> the replication pr proceeds in, not again, but in this case, it proceeds uh, in two directions from a single origin. When uh, in the previous case, in non-circular case, it, it was, again, uh, initiating from the single origin, but it had one direction to go. So this is closed circular DNA, which means if you unwind it like any, any circular strings you, one will deal with, if you uh, unwind on one side, it's going to get super coiled. Uh, ahead of the replication fork in case of DNA, right? So um, how to deal with that? So there, there is class of enzymes called DNA topoisomerases that are specifically cutting, like cutting, uh, for example, five phosphodiesterase bonds uh, at, in one particular place of the circular DNA which will help to deal with the supercoiling. So it will relax supercoils by cutting the sugar phosphate backbone bonds, uh, strands of DNA. And then um, the, uh, the replication process will take place as we have described previously. Uh, and then uh, unwound broken strands then sealed by ligase. Uh, and then the synthesis continues uh, bidirectionally until the, the replic replication forks meet to each other. And again, in at that place, another uh, topoisomerases can come to separate these two identical um, circular DNAs. There are three ways to ensure uh, if the information of the DNA is uh, accurate. And uh, so one of them is the redundancy. So either strand of the double helix uh, should be able to specify the sequence of the other strand. And then the precision of the cellular replication machinery. So the DNA polymerase one and three, they have the proofreading ability. We are going to talk about it in more details in future. And then also uh, the DNA uh, repair enzymes uh, is another uh, another uh, way of ensuring the fidelity of DNA information, and we will talk about it in future as well.